All right, good morning officially to all of you. Good morning and welcome to our international audience. Um, I'm sitting down again today. Uh, I've got all these books up here on the table. These are Bibles, and so I want you to pay close attention to what you're going to hear today because I'm going to talk to you about a missing ingredient in getting your prayers answered in faith because, you see, here's the thing. When the tribulation comes, uh, you're going to have to live by faith. You can't just say, well, I'm a Christian. I joined the church 30 years ago. Thank you. You can't just say that and then say, well, I'm good to go. You better watch out because, as we've talked about so many, many times, you have to be a Philadelphian Christian. If you're a lukewarm Christian, you can forget it. You're busting the tribulation wide open. And the only way you can survive is either take the mark of the beast or get your head cut off. And that's not the way to survive. So let's ask God's blessing. We're going to get into this today to show you a, an ingredient in faith that we all need. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless this message. Please inspire the words and the thoughts. And also, not only in my mind, but also in the minds of each one who hears this message today here in this room. And also by way of internet, open up our hearts and minds to really grasp this. In Jesus' name we pray and we believe. Amen. If you got your Bibles, you may want to turn with me to Romans 8. Um, the actual text I'm going to use is Romans 15, but I want you to start in Romans 8. And there's a reason for this. What I want to talk about today, you know, somebody told me a few minutes ago, you talk an awful lot about, about faith. Well, the thing is, you can't please God without faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. Can't do it. And if we're going <clears> to... <throat> escape the tribulation we're going to need it now <clears throat> excuse me steve oakley called me here a couple of days ago it was it thursday i think he called me and said did you hear about the treaty that the jews and the arabs just made this week now it's i asked him are they, did they do it for seven years <laughs> you know because there was a seven year period coming and uh and I went on the internet to try to find some stuff. In fact, I did find something, and somehow I left it on. I was going to read to you what I found. But anyway, um, that treaty, according to one, one news source called The Express, which I found this on the internet, it is believed that that treaty may pave the way for the rebuilding of the Jewish temple. Now, there's been a rumor going around in Israel that they may start building in the year 2020. It's just a rumor. You don't pay a lot of attention to rumors. But on the other hand, what's that rumor based on? Also, remember, I've been talking to you for several years about how that the, the Jews have a legend that the Messiah will come in a jubilee year. Whoever the Messiah is, they don't think it's Jesus, but they say he's coming in a jubilee year. And we've had 39 jubilees since Jesus was on the earth 2,000 years ago. And the next jubilee is the 40th, and that may be around 2030 to 2031. Wouldn't it be interesting if he came back in the 40th jubilee, which is just around the corner? So what <clears throat> this ministry is all about is getting people ready, getting people saved, but getting Christians ready when these days come. Because if that's the case, there's a seven-year period before the jubilee. If, that's, if he comes back, and I don't know, I'm not saying dates. But if he did come back that soon, there's going to be a seven-year period before it. They're going to rebuild the temple. They're going to offer up animal sacrifices for three and a half years. In the midst of that seven-year period, the sacrifices and oblation are caused to cease, Daniel 9, 27 says, because of the abomination that makes desolate. And Jesus said, when you see that abomination spoken of by Daniel the prophet, if you're on the housetop, run. If you're out in the field, don't come back to the house. Run, run, for then shall be great tribulation. And so, folks, that could happen in the next four or five years from now. It could. Well, could it be another hundred years? Yeah, could be if God wants it to go that long. But do you really think that God brought the Jews back in 1948 if it's going to be another hundred years yet from us? That in 1967 they got the Temple Mount, that they've been working on it with two schools to train the Levites, at least two, to train the Levites how to offer up animal sacrifices. They are now ready. they got the menorah, and a glass case over there where you go over there and look at it, but you can't touch it. They've got everything ready. Now, you think God's going to have them sit on it for 100 years, 50 years, maybe not even 25 years? They're ready now. As of, I think, this past year, uh, they built the last piece of furniture they needed. They are now ready to build the temple. So why do we talk so much about faith? Until you've walked on water or until you've moved a mountain, you still don't know enough. I'm still learning. In fact, what I'm going to share with you today, I've never shared in class before. For all those of you who are graduates, you can say, yeah, that's right. I don't think you ever talked about this before. So this is going to be a little bit of new information. 
because I'm always asking God to give me new revelation, and he does. So have you found Romans 8? <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, look at verse 24. I want to welcome our visitors. I want to welcome you all. Glad you're here today. I'm going to talk to you after the service is over. Uh, Romans 8 and 24 says, We are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. You know, I hope to get a job, all right? Once I get the job, I don't hope for it anymore. Or I hope to get some need met. Well, once the need is met, I don't hope for it anymore. For what a man sees, what does he yet hope for? You know, if, if you're hoping your girlfriend will marry you, once she marries you, you don't hope anymore, okay? Once you, you, you want a child, well, you had the child, you don't hope anymore, unless you hope for two or three. So once you get what it is you're hoping for, there's no more reason to hope. But if we hope for that we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. We don't see the second coming of Christ, but, but we're hoping we'll see it in our lifetime. Every one of us would like to see Jesus come back in our lifetime. The very idea of being buried out in the cemetery just doesn't appeal to us too much. And yet it could happen to every one of us, and that wouldn't be anything to worry about because you'd never know about it. You'd close your eyes, the next moment of your consciousness you'd be with Christ in the resurrection. So you never know about, but still, the idea of this beautiful body of yours being buried in the, in the ground, you don't like that too well. So we hope Jesus comes back in our lifetime. But something I want to point out to you about the word hope. That's the way we show trust in God is in waiting. Mm -hmm. We show our trust in God by waiting for him. Now, the word hope in English is like what people say, I hope I win the lottery. I'm not expecting to win it out of all the millions of people who, now, by the way, I don't personally play the lottery, and I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the person who buys the tickets. I hope to win several million dollars. Do you expect it? No. There's, they say there's more chance of getting struck by lightning than it is by winning the lottery. So I don't really expect to win. I just hope to win. In modern English, the word hope basically means wishful thinking. You know, a guy in college says, I wish that girl would go out with me. Or a guy in high school, maybe some of you in high school, you remember this. I wish she'd go out with me. That's wishful thinking. So you ask her and she said, no. You know what I mean? So, so hope is wishful thinking. But in the Greek language, it doesn't mean that. The Greek word is elpis, E-L-P-I-S. And this is what it means according to Strong's Concordance and, and Thayer's lexicon as well. Strong's lexicon, I should say. Now, this is what it says. Elpis. If, you're, if you have a Strong's Concordance, you want to check me out on this, it's 1680 in Strong's Lexicon. It means expectation, abstract or concrete, or confidence. Now, you don't have confidence you're going to win the lottery. You just hope you will, meaning you, you wish you would. But in Greek, it means expectation. Quote, it says it's a noun in the New Testament, quote, favorable and confident expectation. Confident expectation. A forward-looking with assurance, unquote. It describes the anticipation, like Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's not wishful thinking. That's expectation. You expect it. The blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thayer's lexicon says the same thing. It means expectation. Now, when I pray, I expect to be healed. I hope. A lot of people say, well, like one lady, I went to Winston-Salem at Baptist Hospital, and I went through the scriptures with her, and I hadn't known her, I hadn't met her before. She was Southern Baptist, as far as I know. I know she was Baptist. I think she was Southern Baptist. She had not heard much about healing or faith. And I had to, in 10 minutes, go through all the scriptures to build up her faith, and 10 minutes is not long enough after sitting in a church where they say, well, that all passed away of the apostles. Now, I'm not saying all Baptists teach that, but there are some that do. I had a fellow I met one time, down here at the restaurant in Concord, and I mentioned healing. He said, oh, well, I'm Baptist. I don't believe in healing. That's what he told me. Real quick, cut me off. I don't believe in that healing stuff. Okay, fine. Um, in fact, we had a fellow here who called me on the phone. I want a refund on my tuition. I said, why? He said, because I'm Baptist and I don't believe in healing. Again, not all Baptists are that way, but brother, he sure was. We refunded his entire amount first week, you know. But here's what I told this fellow that I met at the restaurant. I said, well, I'm not going to try to change your church doctrine, but I've been healed. Can I share my testimony? Well, one thing Baptists love is testimonies. And I sat there and I filled his ears full of how God has healed me. And since that time, God has done even more for me. And you've heard my testimony, so I won't go over that again. 
The word hope means expectation. When I get, when I pray for you to be healed, I expect to see you healed. But there again, Matthew 9 says, according to your faith, be it unto you. If you're not expecting to be healed, then Matthew 18, verse 18 doesn't apply. We have to be in agreement. So if I'm believing for your healing, you need to believe in it. So let's read it that way. We're saved by expectation. But expectation that is seen is not, you're not expecting it. A woman who is expecting a child, we know what that means. But once the child is born, somebody comes up to you, hey, is your wife uh, still expecting? Not anymore. What does that mean? You've had the baby. She is expecting until the baby arrives. But if we expect for what we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. That's how the nine months uh, would be. You're, you're waiting patiently. So that's what that word literally means. Now, in, in uh, chapter uh, 4, I want to go back to chapter 4 of Romans and verse 18. Abraham, against hope, believed in hope. As we say in America, against all hope. Now, how much hope, not, not wishful thinking now, expectation. How much expectation would you have that your 89-year-old wife is going to get pregnant? <laughs> you don't have much expectation for that. The oldest woman I, I knew that had a baby, she was, she was in her 50s. The little baby was born perfectly, but she'd already had several children before. But an 89-year-old woman, just you don't expect them to ever be expecting. And yet she became pregnant. Nine months later, when she was 90 years old, Isaac was born. So here it says, against hope, absolutely, medically, totally, against all expectations, what that means. He still believed in it, even though it was against all expectation. That, the reason he believed or had hope or expectation is that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now appropriately speaking, dead. When he was about 100 years old, or the deadness of Sarah's womb, he didn't look at the physical circumstances. He looked at God's word. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Now, a lot of Americans, I don't know how it is in Europe, but in, but in America, you can talk to the average churchgoer and say, do you know there's a God? Well, I, uh, I, I have faith that there's a God. How do you know the Bible's true? Well, I really don't know that it's true, but I, I just have faith that it is. That's not faith. The word faith, pistos in Greek, means to know. You know it. I had a conversation with my mother's son years ago, and I was trying to explain to her what faith is like. And I said, faith is, because I'd been healed when I was 21 years of age of this problem that I was born with in my brain, and I knew that I knew that I was healed. And I told my mother, I said, faith is like you have faith the sun will come up tomorrow. You have faith the sun will rise. You may not be here to see it, but but the sun will rise whether you die in your sleep or not. She said, but that's not faith because you know that's going to happen. I said, that's what faith is. You know it's going to happen. By his stripes you're healed. I'm healed right now. you got to, you got to come to that point where you believe you receive when you pray. Mark 11, 24. When you pray, believe you receive and you shall have. Now, either that's true or it's a lie. And if Jesus never lied, never sinned, then it's absolutely true. All right, now let's go to the main text I want to give you. is chapter 15 here and verse 13. Romans. Romans, chapter 15 and verse 13. I'm going to show you a missing ingredient that will make our faith work. This may be an area where sometimes when we don't get healed, when we don't get our prayers answered, this may be part of the problem. Now, the God of hope, verse 13, hope is elpis. It means expectation. And he's making, a, he's putting a, a blessing on them. Now, the God of expectation fill you with all joy and peace in believing. You don't have it yet. That's why you're still believing for it. If you already had it, you wouldn't still be believing for it. <clears throat> Do you have that new job yet? No, but I'm believing. I prayed about it, and I'm believing. Are you healed yet? <clears throat> the Bible says I'm healed. I'm still believing for the manifestation. You see what I'm saying? Let's say you're asking for something that's absolutely miraculous. The doctor says there's no cure for this. So you go, you get anointed, and you say, I'm healed. Thank God I'm healed. The manifestation may not have occurred yet, but you believe you receive it when you pray, and thank God you've got it. 
And the devil says, you ain't got it. You're still sick. I don't care what my body tells me. My body, my body is not what I live by. Jesus didn't say live by your body. He said live by every word of God. I'm going to live by this. Now, that's how I was healed of asthma, too. Same thing. I said, thank God I got it right now. It's like God up in heaven said, do you? Yes, sir, I got it. Says, sir, right here. And from that night forward, that was in 2005, from then until right now, I've never had another asthmatic attack. I never will again for all eternity. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. You're still believing for it, that you may abound in expectation through the power of the Holy Spirit. How do you have that kind of expectation? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. How does a man believe that his 89-year-old wife is going to become pregnant? The power of the Holy Spirit came on him. Be kind of hard otherwise. Was, uh, yeah, right, sure, uh -huh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, sure, she's going to get pregnant. She's 89 years old. But she did. Now, let's look at this very carefully. The God of hope fill you with all joy and, and peace in believing. What that means is, is while you are waiting for the healing, the supply of your need, you're at peace. You ever, you ever pray for something that you really need and you wake up in the middle of the night and you say, what if it doesn't come? What am I going to do? And you say, no, no, God, God said I could have it. Okay, you try to go back to sleep, then you wake up and you're worried again. What if it doesn't come? What if I don't get it? There's no peace in that. When Jesus spoke the word, he had peace about it. Let me ask you this. Now, John 14, 12 says you can do the same words Jesus did. You believe that, right? Because it's in the Bible. You're, okay, I heard another high in here. Did I get any amens? <laughs> you believe it because Jesus said it. So let's all get in our cars right now, and we're going to run down to the cemetery. Who wants to be the first to raise the dead? Now, don't everybody get up and leave now. What I'm saying is this. When Jesus walked up to that tomb, he didn't say, oh, I'm going to try this. I if I didn't look, if John's writing all this down, he's going to put it in the Bible. If this doesn't happen, I'm going to look stupid. His palms weren't sweaty. He had peace. He walks up to the tomb. He didn't say, now listen, guys, I'm going to holler out for Lazarus. Now, if he says something, go and, go and let him out, okay? But now, if you don't hear anything from inside, just leave the stone where it is. See, that's no faith in that. Jesus says, roll the stone away. Now, that took peace. That took peace. He had peace that what he said would come to pass. They rolled the stone away. His own sister, Lazarus' sister, said, you can't do that. He's been in there four days. He said, didn't I tell you if you believed, you'd see the power of God? Well, yeah, but you know, by now he stinks. Forget about it. Roll the stone away. So they did. Hey, Lazarus, come forth. Now, that's, that was total peace. If, if I told you to do that and we had all the cameras on you, wouldn't you be a little bit nervous? Because you're not Jesus Christ. You're still growing in your faith. Let me tell you something. And I, haven't, I don't think I've mentioned this in a faith class before. Until you can say it with absolute peace of mind, you don't have total faith. You don't have total faith. <clears throat> Mark 11, 24, wherever you desire, when you pray, I believe you receive. But verse 23 says you can tell the mountain to do what you want it to do. And if you have no doubt, but you believe that what you say comes to pass, you'll have whatever you say. Remember the ten lepers that came to Jesus. And they were on the other side of this ditch or whatever, and so they were a space away from him. And they asked him to have mercy. And he said, go show yourself to the priest. Now, you don't do that until you're healed. Remember back in Leviticus, it says, once you think you're healed of leprosy, once the leprosy has gone away, you then go to the priest. He inspects you, gives you a clean bill of health. Now you can rejoin society. Well, these guys had le leprosy. And Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. In other words, you're healed. Now that you're healed, go show yourself to the priest. If they had just been from here to over there, they would have said, thank you so much. You know why they didn't thank him? They still had the leprosy. But Jesus believed that what he said would come to pass. He had complete peace about it. Now, they turn around, they're still lepers, and they walk down the road, who knows, maybe a couple of miles, and then 
their healing was manifested. But if they had just been right over there, they would have thanked him on the spot. All ten would have said thank you. The fact that only one returned, man, it was so far away. The other nine said, oh, that's too far to go back. One said, I'm going back anyway and thanking him. If it had just been in sight, they would have thanked him. But they were out of sight. And Jesus never saw those ten lepers again, as far as we know. Now, here's the interesting thing. When the one comes back, what did Jesus say to his disciples? Do you remember? There you go. He said, weren't there ten cleansed? But he never saw them healed. <clears throat> How did Jesus know that, that all ten were cleansed? Because he believed that what he said would come to pass. You know what some of us would have done? Oh, one of them got healed. Isn't that wonderful? Look here. I feel sorry for the other nine. But hey, we got one healed anyway. Uh-uh. He said ten were cleansed. How did he know? Because I spoke the word. If I say they're healed, they're healed, even though I don't see the healing. Jesus never saw the healing in those men. How did he know they were healed? Because he said the word. Now, when you get to that kind of faith where you can just speak the word and say it's done, you can cast out demons easily. What if I cast about it don't come out? Because you don't believe, that's why. Now, what if you tell the demon to leave and you get in your car and go home? Go to sleep and sleep like a baby. Realize that demon's coming out. Now, he may struggle for a while. It may be tomorrow morning before he comes out, but that demon's coming out. When you speak the word, and you, you don't have to stand there and shout and scream and holler and stamp your feet and say, please come out or I'm going to look dumb. No, you tell it one time. You come out in Jesus' name, bang, it's, it's over and done with. What if he doesn't come out? He's going to come out. Do you understand? So you believe that what you say comes to pass. When God said, let there be light, he had total peace. When Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, he had complete peace about it. And so this is something I've never brought out, which I plan to add to our faith class. If you cannot speak in faith and have complete peace about it, you're not where you need to be. What did Jesus say in Mark 11, 22, as it as it reads in the Greek, you remember? He said, have the faith of God. Now, the King James translates it, have faith in God. But, he, but the Greek says, have the faith of God. Look in the margin of your King James Bible. Have the faith of God. Well, the God kind of faith is total, absolute, positive, complete assurance. Now, <clears throat> let, me, let me read to you some other versions here. Uh, some of them say because of your faith, but this is the uh, what is it? This is the century translation. All of these are somewhat paraphrased, but listen to how it's worded here. I pray the God who gives hope will fill you with much joy and peace while you trust in Him. Does that make it plain? While you're trusting God, you haven't seen the lepers healed yet, but you got total peace about it. You haven't seen the money that you need, but you have total peace about it. I met a preacher some years ago. He needed quite a bit of money for his ministry. They'd gotten in way over, way in over their head, and he even thought about dying, just asking God, just let me die, because I just, this is too much pressure on me. But he had to grow in faith. And then he talked to that same preacher, said he needed $50,000. Now, you don't need it right away. He needed it right away to pay some radio bills, and it came in just like that. So you have to have that kind of faith. Are there any questions at this point in time? While you trust in God, may God give you peace and much joy. What's the joy all about? Well, you know what's going to happen. Here's another one. This is the complete Jewish Bible. And uh, I'm going to read to you what it says here. May God, the source of hope, fill you completely with joy and peace as you continue trusting him. So that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may overflow with hope as you're trusting him. Here's the New Living Translation. This is very popular these days. And all new versions are somewhat paraphrases. This says here, uh, I pray that God, the source of hope, may fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. A little bit differently. So because you are trusting in him during that time, you, wanna, you want God to, to give you that peace and joy. Let's see here. So I pray for you Gentiles, this is very paraphrased, that God who gives you hope will keep you happy and full of peace as you believe in him. 
So as you're believing in him for what? For the healing, the money supply, whatever it is that you need. And then the last one here I'm going to read to you. Here's what it says. Um, now these are new versions. Sometimes they paraphrase it very well. Listen to this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. See, as you are trusting God right now for the healing, for the supply of whatever need it is, you're to have peace about it. What if God doesn't do it? That's not peaceful. What if you wake up at night in a cold sweat? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? You just have peace about it. I remember, I just now thought of this about 30 years ago. Uh, there was a situation where, man, I kept, I, I only got about four hours sleep that night. I was worried about it, wake up and worry about it. And I remember where it says, cast all your care over on God. So the next day, I went out to my prayer path behind the house out there, and I walked out there, and I raised my hands. Here's what I did. I could, my stomach was in knots. And I closed my eyes to kind of see what that looked like, and it was like a black cloud in there. And I just reached in, I pulled that out right up through the top of my head. I said, I'm casting it over on you. <sighs> I feel good now because you've got it. I didn't worry about it anymore. I went to sleep, slept, slept like a baby that night. About 10 days later, it was all it was off without my doing a thing. When you get into a situation and you need a miracle from God, cast that care over on God and just have peace about it. What does it say in uh, Psalm 27, verse, 127, verse 2? God gives his beloved sleep, sleep like a baby. Any questions? All right. Now, I want us to take a look at, um, well, you don't have to turn to all these scriptures, but I'm going to turn to them. You can turn to them if you want. I'm going to go to Philippians. This is a familiar scripture. I've read it so many, many times. Philippians 4. Very, very familiar. But if you have to complete peace about it, then this won't be a problem at all. Philippians 4 says in verse 6, be careful for nothing. Careful doesn't mean don't be careful when you're driving. Careful in Greek means filled with care, anxiety. But in everything, what is it you need? In everything that you need, when you pray for it, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding. How can God give you peace in the midst of all that mess? Keep your heart. Your heart won't flutter at night and pound away. and You can't sleep because your heart's just pounding in your chest. God will keep your heart and mind. His peace that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and mind. See that? That peace will just come on you. Yes, sir. What, uh, Philippians 4, what? Philippians 4, um, 6. The, the Amplified says, be anxious for nothing. Or it says, do not fret or have anxiety for anything. But in everything, when you pray, pray with thanksgiving before you even see it come to you. God, thank you, I got it now. The devil says, no, you don't. I don't care what my body tells me or the x-rays tell me or the doctor tells me. God says, I got it, I got it right now. Praise God, I got it. Now, that's one of the keys of getting your prayers answered. Now, I'm not going to turn there, but Jesus told Peter, when thou art converted, and he said that just before his crucifixion. After three and a half years, Peter still wasn't converted. None of the disciples were converted. When thou art converted, you know, strengthen your brethren. When did Peter get converted? Do you know? Remember? On the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. Without the Holy Spirit, you're not converted. So here were men that weren't converted. Now, I want you to go with me to Matthew 18. So I want you to see something here. I've taught this in class. I don't know that I've ever actually uh, given a, in a sermon ever really uh, or a Bible study. Such what we're having here. I don't really know if I've actually gone into this too much. But now in 18, Matthew 18 and verse 1, at the same time the disciples came to Jesus saying, who's the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them and said, truly, that means, well, verily, it means truly, truly. So I'm getting ready to say something that's going to knock your socks off, so I have to preface it by saying truly. I say to you, except you be converted. They weren't converted. They weren't converted. Except you be converted and become as little children, you'll never enter the kingdom. 
Therefore, if you humble yourself, verse 4, as this little child, you'll be greatest in the kingdom. Now, <clears throat> in Matthew 5, verses 17 through 19, the ones who are the greatest in the kingdom are those who keep God's commandments. They're obedient to God's law and teach men so. Here he says, if you humble yourself like a little child, you'll be greatest. Is that a contradiction? It's not a contradiction. No. I had a man to tell me one time, and I shared with him what the Bible said. He said, I don't care what Jesus said, I still don't believe it. And he was planning on becoming a baptized Catholic at that time. I don't care what the Ten Commandments say. I'm not going to do that. Okay. Is that humility or pride? That's pride. I'm going to do what I want to do. Ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. But you take a little child. I know sometimes they get rambunctious, but, you know, say they're 12 years old, whatever. They're humble. They don't have any pride. Unless you become like one of these little children. You're not even going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because you see, when I was a kid, I said, whatever the Bible says, I want to do it. Do you have the humility to say, whatever God tells me to do, I'll keep whatever commandment he tells me to keep. I'll do whatever he tells me to do. If God tells you to leave your job, to leave your country like Abraham was told, to leave the state of North Carolina, I don't think he'll tell you that. I hope he doesn't. I don't want you to leave. But if he did, would you say, yes, Lord? Leave your job. That job pays me a lot of money. I make $100,000 a year from that. It's a really easy job. But God says, no, I don't want you to do that. I want you to become a missionary. I ain't going to do that. That's not humility. Do whatever God says. I asked a, a teacher of mine in high school when I was studying one of the Ten Commandments. I was wondering whether that commandment was still in force and effect. And I said, I don't know yet. I haven't come to a conclusion. But if, if you yourself knew that you were supposed to obey that commandment, would you do it? He looked at me very seriously. He said, and these are his exact words. He said, you know, Keith, I just don't know. The attitude that you should have is, I will do anything God says. Yes, ma'am. Ah, okay, yeah. Do anything God says. I was a teenager, and I was having a hard time understanding the Bible. I was reading all this literature from all these different churches, and I got on my knees beside my bed, and I said, God, I'll do anything you say. Just give me understanding. Because, see, I ain't as smart as a lot of people. It takes me a long time to figure things out. And God didn't just speak to me. He still had me to study and study and study to show myself approved unto God, and I studied that until I got the answers. But I told God this, and you've heard me tell this in class. I said, God, I'll even stand on my head out in the front yard every Tuesday if I find it in this book. Thankfully, I didn't. Because I've never been able to stand on my head. But I meant it. And then I found out about foot washing. <laughs> and, and the early church did that. They called it pedalavium. That was the Latin name for it. They did that at, at, when they took uh, communion once a year in April. They washed each other's feet. I said, Lord, I'll do anything I read in this Bible. I don't care how silly it looks to anybody. I don't care how crazy it looks to anybody. If I find it in this Bible, brother, I'm going to do it. And God knew I meant it, and that's why he's given me understanding. Psalm 111, verse 10, a good understanding have all they that do, not those who talk about it. you got to be willing to do it. Any questions? Now, unless you become converted and become as little children, you won't enter the kingdom. But if you'll humble yourself as a little child, you'll be greatest. Why? Because those who keep God's commandments and teach men so are the greatest in the kingdom. But listen, the only people in this audience, the only people watching me by internet who will keep God's commandments are those who will humble themselves and say, Lord, I'll do whatever you say. But you've got to humble yourself or you're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. Too much trouble. What are you going to do when they offer the mark of the beast to you? And you say, well, no, I can't take that. Well, then you'll starve. Oh, well, then maybe I better go ahead and take it after all. God understands. I had a lady tell me that some years ago up in Virginia. I know what I'm doing is wrong, but God understands. Yes, he does. He certainly does. <clears throat> Now, Romans 8, 7 says we're not subject to God's law until we're converted. When we have our carnal, natural mind that we were born with, we're not subject to his law. 
But now with the divine nature, which we get through conversion, 1 Peter 1, 4 says we have the divine nature. We have now the divine nature of Jesus Christ living in us. And we're also told we have the mind of Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 2, 16. We know he's going to grant our desires. Psalm 37, verse 4. You know, he'll grant, grant the desires of our heart. Now, the Corinthians were suspicious of Paul's motives. They were very suspicious. I won't turn there, but 2 Corinthians 13, 3, Paul said, since you seek a proof of Christ speaking through me. They were so suspicious they would not even tithe to his ministry. Remember, he said, I had to rob other churches to do you service. They weren't supporting Paul's ministry. Even while he was in Corinth preaching to them, praying for their sick, and so on, they wouldn't support him. So the Philippians sent him money so he could be able to continue because they, they were so suspicious. Now, why do I bring that up? We know Paul now was right. But what about God? Are you suspicious that maybe God won't heal you? Are you his, his word says he heals all your diseases. Yeah, but this one's incurable. See, the, the doctor said there's no cure for this one. I prayed for a lady that, that had terminal cancer, went through the scriptures with her. God healed her. And I warned her, I said, now the devil will try to put it back on you eventually. Stand your ground. Sure enough, but it was a different type of cancer altogether. This time it was brain cancer. Now God could heal lymphoma or whatever it was she had, but God can't heal brain cancer, so she just gave up and died. When I went to pray for her, see, that was the wrong thing to do. The Bible says if you're sick, you call for the elders of the church. I went to her. She didn't call for me. She's already planning, on, planning her funeral. She had just gotten off the phone asking people to be her pallbearers at her funeral. It didn't do one bit of good for me to even come see her because she was planning to die. See, God can heal one kind of cancer, but he can't heal the other. Oh, yeah? Come on. God can do anything. If he can heal one kind, he can kill the other. So sometimes we're suspicious. Now, if you've got your Bibles, you might want to turn with me to Galatians. Don't have to because this is just one verse. But I want, to, I want you to pay close attention. If you're taking notes, write down uh, Galatians 5 and verse 6. In Jesus Christ, neither circumcision avails anything if you're Jewish nor uncircumcision. If you're Gentile, red and yellow, black and white, God couldn't care less. Male or female, it doesn't matter. But what counts is this, but faith. Why do you talk so much about faith? Because it avails something. But faith, which works by love. See, I want to get my faith working because when bad times come, and they're here now, aren't they? But Jesus said, this is the beginning of sorrows. When bad times come, I, I've got to do what the Bible says. Live by faith. But how does faith work? Works by love. So maybe you're, you can't get your faith to work. You can't get your faith to work. You got faith, but it's not working very well. Uh, you got a great, big, beautiful Cadillac, and it's brand new, and you can't get it to, you can't get the engine to turn over. And I say, do you have any gas in it? And you say, hey, go what? Gas, you got any gasoline? I don't know. <laughs> Car works by gas, doesn't it? Or diesel. Faith works by love. Airplane works by air. You got to have air out in outer space. Airplane won't fly. You got to have air. So faith works by love. But what is love? Now, if you've had problems getting healed, if you've had problems getting your prayers answered, consider this. The Bible definition of love, I had a preacher to tell me this. He said, I think the only law that Christians are under today is the law of love. We don't have to do anything. Don't have to keep the Ten Commandments or anything else. We're only under the law of love. But what is the Bible definition of love? Here it is, 1 John 5 and verse 2. And this, by this we know we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. To love God is to keep his commandments. In John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, verse 3 says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. His commandments. Some people say, I don't keep God's commandments. I just keep Christ's commandments. This says keep God's commandments. We're to keep the Ten Commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. No, we're not under the law where salvation is concerned. But I'm already saved. Thank you very much. I'm under his grace. I'm already saved. I'm keeping the law now to show my love. 2 John, the next page over, 2 John verse 6. This is love. Here's the definition of love, that we walk after his commandments. 
He said, this is the commandment that you've heard from the beginning. You ought to walk in it from the beginning. Way back here in the Old Testament, we're to keep those laws of God. Don't say, I love God with all my heart. If you love God with all your heart and you're not keeping the commandments with all your heart, you don't love God with all your heart. Sometimes I feel like I'm running out of gas. <laughs> you will. Faith comes and goes. That's why you have to keep getting filled up on it over and over and over. You keep it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing. Not hearing it 10 years ago, but hearing it. Car runs by, keep, you keep filling it up and you keep filling it up. And I got to fill mine up tomorrow. You keep filling it up. And faith, you have to keep getting filled. How do you get filled? You need, you need gas in it. You need gas in it in the garage for a little bit. It'll go still. You get bad. You, gotta, you, gotta, you, you have to get new gas every time. Because yeah, they put steel gas in your car, it's still not going to work. Yeah. You have to have new gas, new gas. Yeah. You know, that's where you got to Right. You need, right, right, need, right. Yeah, yeah. If you don't drive it, your battery will go down. Yeah, you have to yeah. keep recharging yeah. driving it to keep yeah. recharging yeah. that battery. And how do you recharge your battery? You yeah. Know, Faith works by love, and love is the keeping of the law. How does faith work? I want to get my faith work. You gotta, you gotta live by love. Oh, well, how do I live by love? Keep his commandments. So if you want your faith to work, obey God. Now Jesus said, I have, this is John 15, I have kept my father's commandments. He had total peace that when he spoke something, God would do it. One of the reasons that Christians don't get their prayers answered is because they don't have a really, 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 really close relationship with God and I'm basing that on scripture <clears throat> if I tell you I'll pick on JR because he's handy <clears throat> and also he's nice enough he won't hit me after service <laughs> if, I say, if I say JR I'm going to give you $10,000 I like you you're a nice fellow I'm going I'm to put it in your bank account <laughs> and he says oh that's wonderful Keith and I, and I say, just going on, you write, get your check and start writing checks on it. He's not going to do that. Not until he calls the bank and say, uh, <clears throat> did somebody deposit $10,000 in my bank account? He's not, he, now he knows me, he trusts me, but only up to a point. But now if his wife says, hey, I just put some money in the bank. Okay, how much do I put in there? He doesn't even check the bank. He, he knows her. Why? He's got a relationship with her that he doesn't have with anybody else. If she says, I just put $1,000 in the bank, go put it, add it to your checkbook. He just adds it to his checkbook. He doesn't even check. But if I tell him that, he's going to check. See, when you get to know God, you have a relationship. You know what God will do. You know what he'll do because you have this close relationship with God. What's that? He can't lie. He won't lie. I want to show you a scripture here. In 1 John 4, back up one page. 1 John 4. And here's what it says. Verse 16. We, Christians, we have known and believed the love that God has to us. Do you believe the love that God has to you? Oh, I know God loves me. The Bible tells me so. But do you really know it? Do you really, 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 really know God loves you? Because if he loves you, he's going to he said he wants you to be happy. People say, well, if God loves me, why did he let this happen? If he loves me. See there, that's not believing it. I know God loves me. Well, why did he let this happen? I don't know, but I know God loves me. Do you believe that God has the, the love that God has for you? Let me share a true story with you real quick. A friend of mine down in Texas, his name was Chuck Baldwin, greatest Christian I ever met up to that time I, and I mean just he had more faith than anybody I've ever met in my life and brother he lived the Christian life too uh, he was a salty character though I mean he'd sit there and smoke and he may throw out a dam or something like that I mean he was just a, a regular guy he would he didn't walk around looking holy all the time I mean he was a real man not that you got to be a real man to do that but what I mean is he didn't put on airs is what I'm saying he somebody said you know if you quit smoking you'd be a, have a better witness he said I like to smoke he wouldn't give it up and when I first met him, he had a cigarette in his mouth, and somebody told me he was a fine Christian. I thought, well, now, why is he there smoking that cigarette? But you know, when I got to know him, I found out that that cigarette-smoking guy was the, the finest Christian I had ever met in my whole life, and he had so much faith, he could pray for anything, and he knew God was listening, and he knew God loved him, and he knew God would answer his prayers. I went, 
I was on my way. I dropped something off uh, at his house, and I said, I got to hurry up. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the specialist. My dentist wanted to touch this abscess tooth. I've got to get a root canal. He said, have you prayed about it? Well, no, I hadn't thought about it. I was in my 20s. I said, I didn't think about praying about it. He said, well, come here. He laid his hands on mine. He, he didn't say, Lord, don't let it hurt when they do the operation. He said, Lord, let this be for a testimony. I thought, that's a nice prayer. I wish you to pray it wouldn't hurt. I was scared, man. I've always been scared to go to the dentist. Until just recently, I'm learning not to be. But anyway, I went down to the guy, and he x-rayed the tooth, and he looked at me. He says, what do you want me to do for that tooth? I said, I want you to fix it. I got an abscess. He said, look at the x-ray. That is a perfect tooth. Never had any more problems with it that I know of. When that man prayed, he knew God was hearing him. Is that the kind of faith you've got? A fellow called him. I wish I'd have written down all the stories I heard him tell, but a fellow called him up and said, my little girl has got spinal meningitis, and she's only, they don't think she's going to make it through the night. Would you pray? He said, well, I don't know much about what that is. Let me get my medical books down. I'm going to find out what we're praying about, and then I'll call you. He, he spent an hour or so, got his medical books out, studied spinal meningitis. And he said, I know now how to pray for this. He said, you get on your knees at your house. I'm going to get on my knees here and on the phone. We're going to pray for your daughter, and God's going to heal her. Now, she, they didn't think she'd make it through the night. The next morning, the father, she made it through the night. The next morning, the father went to see her, and uh, she was sitting up in bed eating breakfast. She was in a coma when they prayed for her. They didn't think she'd ever wake up. Now, that's the kind of faith that man had. He just knew God answered his prayers. He had peace about it. You think about that. He had peace about it. Another story. Let me tell you one more story about this man. And I knew him well. If, if somebody else had told me these stories, I wouldn't have believed it, but I knew him. I believed him. <clears throat> uh, there was a fellow named David in that little church that Chuck started. Chuck started this little church. He wasn't the pastor, but there was a young fellow in his 20s, uh, about my age, and he, this young fellow said, I want to start a church in that shack out there that you've got. And so Chuck said, okay, I'll help you get it started. And so one of the people who started attending that little church they had out there in that little shack, his name was David. He was a rough character, a nice guy, but kind of rough. All he did was work at a gas station. He pumped gas for a living. And uh, David said, I found that there's something in Dallas. There's a seminar there. They're going to teach you how to, how to make a lot of money. It's a new business venture. And I really want to go. Chuck, do you want to go with me? He said, yeah, I'll go with you. He said, well, you have to pay $50 admission to get in. But it sounds really good. Chuck said, okay. He said, uh, now, Chuck sometimes didn't have the money. He gave stuff away a lot. Sometimes he didn't have money on hand. So Chuck, Chuck said, I don't have the 50 now, but I'll have it then. They were going to leave like on Friday, whatever it was. I don't remember. So my friend Chuck here was, he was in his, at that time in his 40s or maybe early 50s. He ran a carpet shop. And so David came in at 4 o'clock and they sat down. He said, did you get the $50? He said, no, I don't have it yet, but I'll have it by 5 o'clock. Because they, they had to leave at 5. They had, it takes two hours to get to Dallas, Texas from Tyler. And they, the seminar started at 7, so they had to leave at exactly 5 o'clock and get their own time. And that's just getting in there when they're getting ready to start. So they sat there and talked for a while. And uh, about... About 4.30, David said, now listen to this now, listen to this. David said, uh, Chuck, uh, who's bringing you the $50? He said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew David too. He had a conniption fit right there. He said, what do you mean you don't know? He said, well, see, I prayed about it, and I asked the Lord to provide me $50 by 5 o'clock. He'll be here. <laughs> they were sitting there all by themselves. Very few people ever came into his carpet store. Once in a while, one would come in, you know. And uh, nobody had been there. And here it was about a, <laughs> David said, you, you mean you don't have, you got to have the $50 cash. And David didn't have it to loan him. Chuck said, don't worry about it. I've already prayed about it. God will provide it. <laughs> True story. Uh, at a quarter till five, they only had 15 minutes before they had to leave. He heard a car drive up and looks out there. His big Cadillac comes up. This big tall Texan wearing a cowboy hat. Gets out of the car, walks in. He says, uh, I need some carpet. He said, how much you need? I need so many square feet. He said, how much you charge a uh, square foot? He tells me. He says, well, I'll tell you what. Let, give me so many square foot. How much would that be? He said, here. He handed him $50. That was all it cost was exactly $50. At five minutes till five, he put the $50 in his pocket. He said, come on, David, let's go. <laughs> I mean, he told story after story like that. And some of it's hard to believe, but then when you get around him, you see things happen. I mean, it's amazing. I told his wife one time, I said, if God could only hear one person pray at a time, and I was praying, 
And Chuck interrupted. God would put me on hold to hear what he had to say. <laughs> he had such a peace about it. Now, that's the kind of faith that we should all have. When Jesus prayed, he had faith. In fact, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter pulls his sword out. He's going to kill Malchus, the servant of the high priest. Jesus said, look, man, I could pray the Father right now. He'd send me 12 legions of angels. He didn't say he might. He said he would. Jesus absolutely knew that God would deliver him from the cross. All he had to do was ask, and he didn't. So do you have that kind of faith? I want to read to you one more thing, and then I'm going to show you our commercial that we're running now. You can't, you can't live by how you feel. You've got to live by what God's Word says. If God's Word says you're healed, you believe it. It's like a pilot flying by the seat of his pants. My favorite fiction author, and I don't read too many fiction authors, is Richard Bach. He's a pilot. And he was in the Air Force, and this was back in the 50s when he had to carry bombs under his wings. I, don't, I guess they still do that. In fact, I'm sure some of them do. But I know that for a fact. But he was flying at nighttime in bad weather, and he had to fly on instruments because he couldn't see anything. Now, I know for a fact when you get up there and you think you're flying straight and level, you have to look at your instruments. One time I was flying, I was the passenger, and the other guy said, I gotta check the map, would you fly the airplane for a moment? I said, okay, I'm flying along, and I couldn't see the ground, and I couldn't see instruments, because the instruments was over there. So I'm just looking at that cloud, and I'm flying straight and level with that cloud. And the guy says, what are you doing? I said, flying straight and level. He says, no, you're not. The instrument shows you're turning to the left. I'm out here doing this, see? Because you can't go by what you feel. You gotta go by the instruments. You can't go by what you feel. When God says you're healed, you believe what God said because this Bible is like the instrument panel in an airplane. Now listen to what he said here. He said, uh, weather is still an enemy to every pilot. The cloud robs me of the horizon. I cannot see outside the cockpit. I, he was flying an Air Force jet. I am forced to depend completely on seven expressionless faces in glass that are my flight instruments. There is in weather no absolute up or down. Uh, Patty Wagstaff, the most famous woman aviator, she wears these long dangling earrings everywhere she goes. And somebody asked her, do you wear those earrings when you're flying? She said, absolutely. They're my vertical indicators because she's a stunt pilot. And when she's upside down, she doesn't know she's upside down except her earrings go like this. <laughs> now she can look at the instrument panel, but that's a secondary instrument. There's only a row of instruments that say this is up, this is down, this is the horizon. When so much of the, my flying is done in the clear world of air to ground gunnery, it is uh, easy to stake my life on the word of a two-inch circle of glass. He said, it is, it is not easy to just depend on that. Yet it's the only way to stay alive after my airplane sinks into a cloud. I've been in solid cloud. I had to depend on instruments. The feel and the senses that hold the, the Piper, that's his airplane, or maybe they, I don't know, that's not Piper, steady on the tank are easily confused when the world outside is a faceless flow of gray. Can't see anything. After a turn or the harmless movement of tilting my head to look at the radio set as I change frequencies, those senses can become shocked and panic-stricken and can shout, and here's an italic, you're diving to the left, although the gyro horizon is a calm and steady guide on the instrument panel. Caught in the contradiction, I have a choice. Follow one voice or follow the other. The, the doctor says you're dying. God's word says you're healed. You have a choice. Your body says, you hurt, but, but you've been prayed for, you've been anointed. God says, I'm healed. What are you going to believe? Or whatever it is that you might need. Follow one voice or follow the other. Follow the sense that marks me expert and strafe and rocket and high angle dive bomb. Or follow the little bit of tin and glass which someone has told me is the thing to trust. Right here, this is what you trust right here. Over and above what your body tells you. He said, I follow the tin and the war is on. Listen, there is a war in your soul when you're trying to believe what God said and you're hurting. Don't wait till you're in the hospital to build up your faith. Build up your faith now while you're healthy. And then when the doctor says you're dying and you're hurting all over, you got your faith built up. Say, I don't care what my body says. God says I'm healed. Thank God I'm healed. And I've seen miracles that way. Remember the man, the man I told you about that's paralyzed in the hospital? I wish I had said take up your bed and walk, but I didn't say that. <laughs> he got up and started running. He was healed instantly. He said, the war is on because you're going to get a contradiction. Vertigo, that's when your mind is spinning, you can't tell up from down, has become so strong that I've had to lean my helmet almost to my shoulder in accord with its, ver its version of up and down, but still I fly the instruments. 
keep the little tin airplane level in the glass. You have an artificial horizon. And then in italics he says, and I'm going to read it the way he wrote it, your banking heart to the right. Keep the altimeter and vertical speed needles steady. Look out, you're starting to dive. Keep the turn needle straight up at the ball in the center of its curved glass tube. You're rolling, you're upside down and you're rolling. Keep crossing the check check, and checking the instruments. One to the next, to the next, to the next. No matter what your body tells you, I was under the hood doing instrument training. And every VFR pilot who doesn't even get his instrument ready still has to take the training. I had a lady instructor sitting over there. She put me under the hood, close your eyes, and she's doing the airplane like this, up and down, up and down. And then she said, now, tell me what the airplane is doing. Don't look out. What's the airplane doing? I'm under the hood, got my eyes closed. I said, we're turning to the left. Are you sure? Yep, I can feel it. We're turning to the left. She said, now open up your eyes. I lifted up the hood, we're going straight and level. Everybody asked pilots that they knew, what happened to John F. Kennedy Jr. when he crashed? We, they all wanted to know. They checked the airplane after they found the wreckage in the water. There was absolutely nothing wrong with his airplane. It was pilot error. His instruments told him he was diving right into the ocean, and he chose not to follow that voice. He followed his feelings. He was in uh, marginal VFR conditions. They had six miles of, of visual, and he was over the water with no landmarks. He, he couldn't tell where he was. It was a total void. Now, I've flown at night, and when you take off at night, you don't even see the stars. All you see is blackness. And I'll tell you, that's scary. You're, you think you're in the twilight zone. I mean, you just have to look at those instruments, and no matter what you feel, you have to make a decision. Do I believe my instruments, or do I believe what I feel? John F. Kennedy went by his feelings and got himself killed, his wife killed, and his sister-in-law killed because he would not believe what his flight instruments told him. If you want to survive the Great Tribulation, you're going to have to believe what this book says. You're going to have to live by every word of God. Keep his commandments to get your faith to work. And then when you need food, when times get rough, God will provide for you. So, if God, if you believe the love that God has for you, wouldn't you want to do everything you can to return that love and be obedient to him? Any questions? I hope this was helpful. There's some questions online that are kind of off topic that you want to go into. Oh, I'll answer later. For those of you who are writing questions online, I'll, I'll try to answer you this afternoon. Now, what I want to show you here. Do you want me to try and move the camera? Yeah, maybe they can see it. Don't even worry about that stand. Maybe they can see it. I hope so. <clears throat> We're on, uh, <clears throat> we are advertising for our autumn classes. And I. Go ahead and get this fixed while I'm no, talking. I didn't want me to leave it no, 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 go ahead and get it fixed while I'm talking. So what, some of these commercials are running 70 times a day, I think it is, is that right? Yeah, across between Northern Mecklenburg County, yeah. all the way to Rowan, Cabarrus, Stanley, and Ireland. Yeah. It's a short commercial, um, and I want, what I want to ask all of you to do is pray in faith, that everybody that God is calling, John 644, God has to call people to salvation. Everybody that God is calling around here, that they will see that ad and that the people that he wants to be here this autumn will be here this autumn. Okay? It's as far as I can move it without dragging that lamp down. Oh, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, you might want to zoom in on it or something. As far as, oh, that's as, as far as, as you can zoom. Okay. If I zoom in, it'll cut off the screen. Okay, fine. You want me to start it? Yeah, so watch this. It's only about 25 seconds. That's not it. That's the commercial before. Remember these commercials? They put five or six commercials in a row. <clears throat> so this one. Nine one nine two one two two today. Right. These commercials are. We're here for you because you're here for all of us. Are you interested in earning your college degree in just nine months, attending classes only two nights a week? It's possible at Ambassador Christian College in Kannapolis, located in your I-85. We offer classes in biblical studies with four degree programs up to doctoral level. No math or science classes required. Our graduates can earn their college degree easily and move on to higher paying positions after graduation. We also offer scholarship opportunities. For more information on applying, call or visit our website today. Mm -hmm. uh, I want y'all to 
y'all to pray. In fact, I want to pray, and I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and I want y'all to just be in agreement with yeah. me. We're going to ask God to let the right people see that commercial. How many of you have seen that, by the way, by accident? Anybody? I've seen it on purpose. I've seen it on purpose. That's how it's ever recorded. So let's ask God now that, that uh, to bless us. Eternal God, we're doing what we can, but we can't do anything without your help. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. So I'm asking you, Father, and Jesus said, anything we ask you in his name, you'll do it. So I'm asking you now, the people that you're calling in this area, the people that you have a great call in their life, to have a great reward in your kingdom, the people that you want to call and give them this great reward, let them see that commercial. God, let them just happen to tune in and see that commercial and be here with us this autumn so that they can learn the word of God and have a great reward in your kingdom. We believe we receive it. We ask it in the name of your son, and it is done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. amen. You believe amen. it. Now, amen. use your faith. Amen. All right. Any other questions or comments? I just got a comment. Okay. okay. All of this that you've been talking about today is relying on us being obedient. Yeah. Faith works by love, and love works by obedience. Okay. And Hebrews 5, 9, it says, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Now, I'm a simple man. Yeah. And when I read and I, and, and I hear that I'm supposed to live by every word of God, that means every place he says do something, do it. Every place in the Bible. Every word of God includes uh, the Old Testament as well. And that has to do with salvation. Yeah. And Acts 5.32 is talking about receiving the Holy Spirit. To them that obey him. Okay. And I'll, read, I'll, I'll just read the last part. It says, so it's also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them to us that obey him. Yeah. While, while we're not under the law where you have to have already obeyed him to be saved, to get saved, you must, you must make a commitment that you're going to live. And Jesus said, why do you call me Lord? You won't do what I say. So we've got to make a commitment. And, and it all has to do with him. If we choose God's way and not ours. Yeah. I wish we had several thousand people here in Kannapolis who were willing to serve God. A lot of them just don't know. And many of the ones who do know say, nah, I think I'll follow my traditions. Anyway, any other comments before we dismiss? Well, I appreciate everybody coming. Good to have our visitors back here. Uh, this is uh, Craig, right? Craig Poplin. And I didn't get your name. John Jones. John Jones. Well, that'll be easy to remember. Okay, Mr. Poplin, Mr. Jones, good to have y'all. We're dismissed. Amen. Yeah. Oh, good for